Atomization of an Unknown Man, 1637, by Franz Mir, by John Connolly. One. The painting, titled The Anatomization of an Unknown Man, is one of the more obscure works by the minor Dutch painter Franz Mir. It is an unusual piece, although its subject matter may be said to be typical of our time. The opening up of a body by what is, one initially assumes, a surgeon or anatomist. The light from a suspended lamp falling over the naked body of the anonymous man. His scalp peeled back to reveal his skull. His innards exposed as the anatomist's blade hangs suspended above him, ready to explore further the intricacies of his workings. The central physical component of the universe's rich complexity. I was not long ago in England, and witnessed there the hanging of one Elizabeth Evans, Canbury Bess, they called her, a notorious murderer and cut purse, who was taken with her partner, one Thomas Shearwood. Country Tom was hanged, and then gibbeted at Gray's Inn Fields. But it was the fate of Elizabeth Evans to be dissected after her death at the Barber Surgeon's Hall, for the body of a woman is of more interest to the surgeons than the body of a man, and harder to come by. She wept and screamed as she was brought to the gallows, and cried out for a Christian burial, for the terror of the hall was greater to her than that of the noose itself. Eventually the hangman silenced her with a rag, for she was disturbing the crowd. Something of her fear had communicated itself to the onlookers, though, for there was a commotion at the gallows, as I recall. Although the surgeons wore the guise of commoners, yet the crowd knew them for what they were, and a shout arose that the woman had suffered enough under the law, and that she should have no further barbarities visited upon her. Although I fear the concern was less for the dignity of her repose than the knowledge that the mob was to be deprived of the display of her carcass in chains at St. Pancras, and the slow exposure of her bones, at King's Cross. Still, the surgeons had their way, for when the hangman was done with her, she was cut down and stripped of her apparel, then laid naked in a chest and thrown into a cart. From there she was carried to the hall near unto Cripplegate. For a penny I was permitted, with others, to watch as the surgeons went about their work, and a revelation it was to me. But I digress. I merely speak of it to stress that Mir's painting cannot be understood in isolation. It is a record of our time, and should be seen in the context of the work of Valverde, and Estienne, and Spigelius, and Berrettini, and Berengarius, those other great illustrators of the inner mysteries of our corporeal form. Yet look closer, and it becomes clear that the subject of Mir's painting is not as it first appears. The unknown man's face is contorted in its final agony, but there is no visible sign of strangulation, and his neck is unmarked. If he is a malefactor taken from the gallows, then by what means was his life ended? Although the light is dim, it is clear that his hands have been tied to the anatomist's table by means of a stout rope. Only the right hand is visible, admittedly, but one would hardly secure one, and not the other. On his wrist are gashes where he has struggled against his bonds, and blood pours from the table to the floor in great quantities. The dead do not bleed in this way. And if this is truly a surgeon, then why does he not wear the attire of a learned man? Why does he labor alone in some dank place, and not in a hall? Or theater? Where are his peers? Why are there no other men of science, no assistants, no curious onlookers enjoying their pennies worth? This, it would appear, is secret work. Look, there in the corner, behind the anatomist, head tilted to stare down at the dissected man. Is that not the head and upper body of a woman? Her left hand is raised to her mouth, and her eyes are wide with grief and horror. But here, too, a rope is visible. 
she is also restrained, although not so firmly as the anatomist's victim. Yes, perhaps victim is the word, for the only conclusion to be drawn is that the man on the table has suffered under the knife. This is no corpse from the gallows, and this is not a dissection. This is something much worse. 2. The question of attribution is always difficult in such circumstances. It resembles, one supposes, the investigation into the commission of a crime. There are clues left behind by the murderer, and it is the work of an astute and careful observer to connect such evidence to the man responsible. The use of a single source of light, shining from right to left, is typical of Mir. So too is the elongation of the faces, so that they resemble wraiths more than people, as though their journey into the next life has already begun. The hands, by contrast, are clumsily rendered, those of the anatomist excepted. It may be that they are the efforts of others, for Mir would not be alone among artists in allowing his students to complete his paintings. But then it could also be that it is Mir's intention to draw our gaze to the anatomist's hands. There is a grace, a subtlety to the scientist's calling, and Mir is perhaps suggesting that these are skilled fingers holding the blade. To Mir, this is an artist at work. 3. I admit that I have never seen the painting in question. I have only a vision of it in my mind based upon my knowledge of such matters. But why should that concern us? Is not imagining the first step towards bringing something into being? One must envisage it, and then one can begin to make it a reality. All great art commences with a vision, and perhaps it may be that the vision is closer to God than that which is ultimately created by the artist's brush. There will always be human flaws in the execution. Only in the mind can the artist achieve true perfection. 4. It is possible that the painting called The Anatomization of an Unknown Man may not exist. 5. What is the identity of the woman? Why would someone force her to watch as a man is torn apart, compel her to listen to his screams as the blade takes him slowly, exquisitely apart? Surgeons and scientists do not torture in this way. Thus, if we are not gazing upon a surgeon at work, then, for want of another word, we are looking at a murderer. He is older than the others in the picture, although not so old that his beard has turned grey. The woman, meanwhile, is beautiful. Let there be no doubt of that. Mir was not a sentimental man and would not have portrayed her as other than she was. The victim, too, is closer in age to the woman than the man. We can see it in his face, and in the once youthful perfection of his now ruined body. Yes, perhaps he has the look of a Spaniard about him. 6. I admit that Franz Mir may not exist. 7. With this knowledge, gleaned from close examination of the work in question, let us now construct a narrative. The man with the knife is not a surgeon, although he might wish to be, but he has a curiosity about the nature of the human body that has led him to observe closely the attentions of the anatomists. The woman? Let us say, his wife. Lovely, yet unfaithful fickle in her affections, weary of the aging body that shares her bed, and hungry for firmer flesh. And the man on the table, then, is, or was, her lover. What if we were to suppose that the husband has discovered his wife's infidelity? Perhaps the young man is his apprentice, one whom he has trusted and loved as a substitute for the child that has never graced his marriage. Realizing the nature of his betrayal, the master lures his apprentice to the cellar, where the table is waiting. No, wait, he drugs him with the tainted wine, 
for the apprentice is younger and stronger than he is, and the master is unsure of his ability to overpower him. When the apprentice regains consciousness, woken by the screams of the woman trapped with him, he is powerless to move. He adds his voice to hers. But the walls are thick and the cellar deep. There is no one to hear. A figure advances, and the lamp catches the sharp blade, and the grim work begins. 8. So, this is our version of the truth, our answer to the question of attribution. I, Nicolas Damon, did kill my apprentice Mantegna. I anatomized him in my cellar, slowly taking him apart, as though, like the physicians of old, I might be able to find some as yet unsuspected fifth humor within him, some black and malignant thing responsible for his betrayal. I did force my wife, my beloved Judith, to watch as I removed skin from flesh and flesh from bone. When her lover was dead, I strangled her with a rope, and I wept as I did so. I accept the justice and wisdom of the court's verdict, that my name should be struck from all titles and records and never uttered again, that I should be taken from this place and hanged in secret, and then, while still breathing, that I should be handed over to the anatomists and carried to their great temple of learning, there to be taken apart while my heart beats, so that the slow manner of my dying might contribute to the greater sum of human knowledge, and thereby make some recompense for my crimes. I ask only this, that an artist, a man of some small talent, might be permitted to observe and record all that transpires. So the painting called The Anatomization of an Unknown Man might at last come into existence. After all, I have begun the work for him. I have imagined it. I have described it. I have given him his subject and willed it into being. For I, too, am an artist in my way. Intruders by Dominic Power It starts with the sound of breaking glass. Jane and Anthony are in the room with me, and I put my arms around them, and we cling to each other. We know who it is, before we hear the footsteps on the stairs, and the voice shouting, out of control. I wanted to make a safe place for my daughter and grandson, but it's too late. There is an intruder in the house, and everything stops here. You've never felt this lonely before, driving in the darkness on the Essex back roads. The shotgun is on the back seat, under your coat, next to the bottle of vodka. The barrage of images, the collapse of your property empire, angry shareholders, bankruptcy, and the court order denying you access to your wife and son, are how you stop yourself from confronting the one unbearable memory. None of this has been your fault. People stopped believing, that's all. A fox runs out into the road. Its eyes glitter in the headlights before it disappears. But in that brief moment, you believe that, by some primitive instinct, it knows you. And somewhere inside the truth hits you, that for all your motivational skills, you are not somebody that people like. You're on the dual carriageway now, the roadside lined with boarded-up shops and fast-food outlets. You pull in at an all-night garage and buy a sandwich from the shop. Sitting in the car, chewing ravenously, you fight a rising nausea. A white van pulls into the forecourt and a group of teenage boys pile out. One fills a petrol can from the pump. 
A hooded boy does a series of robotic movements while his friend photographs him on a mobile phone. The face under the hood reminds you of Antony, and you feel an ache so intense that you have to get away. As you drive past them, he stares at you with something like hatred, while his friend holds up his phone and takes your picture. You turn off the main road into a wasteland of deserted pubs and burnt-out shops. This is a ghost town, and it will be a long time before they find you here. You take the vodka and the shotgun out of the car and clamber over the chain-link fence. On the first building, someone has spray-painted the words, The End, and you know that you've come home. His name is George Franklin. He is huddled in a sleeping bag in the dark, his eyes squeezed shut. He listens, and he is afraid. But then he has been afraid for most of his life. Next to him, a small dog sleeps, its nose buried deep in the ruined sleeping bag for comfort. Somewhere at the far end of the space, a glass window is shattered, and the dog lifts its head to bark. George clamps his hand over its muzzle, stroking its neck, as he shrinks further into the sleeping bag. The intruders are here, and this time they will kill him. There are muffled footsteps and the sound of a click. A single car passes on the road outside, and its headlights momentarily flood the space. George sees a man in a camel overcoat, the barrel of a shotgun under his chin, and he screams. When you hear the scream, you think you've pulled the trigger. You open your eyes. In the darkness, a dog is barking. Then you are caught in a feeble ray of light. Dimly, you see a figure crouching in a sleeping bag, holding a torch, trying to restrain a puppy. He shouts, Don't! And you realize that the gun is pointed at him. You sink down on the concrete floor and push the gun away. A voice says, this is my place. You're an intruder. You edge towards him, holding out the bottle of vodka. He takes it and says, Boys break in here. Last time they tried to burn me in my sleeping bag. You nod, but you're not interested. It's the man himself that holds your attention. His face is scabbed, hair matted and filthy, and his features are hidden behind a ragged beard. Yet he's younger than he looks. About your age, in fact. He lifts the bottle to his lips and drinks, with a surprising fastidiousness, and hands it back to you. In that moment, you glimpse yourself in him, and it hits you with a dazzling clarity. This homeless, friendless outcast, alcoholic, probably violent and certainly mad, is going to save your life. As you talk, you relive the injustice of it all, the sheer envy and malice that it took to get you to this place. It was Jane's bitch of a mother that did this to you. It was she who undermined you, who turned your wife and son against you, always sweetly reasonable as she dripped the poison into your marriage. When you talk about her, you find yourself shouting and have to control yourself. The bottle passes back and forth, he turns out to be a surprisingly dainty drinker, and so you have the lion's share of the bottle. It helps you to think, to see things straight for the first time, to understand how much you are the victim. You don't see the empathy in his eyes, nor the occasional flicker of disgust that crosses his face. You are too caught up in the story, and it's denouement. George has saved your life just by being here. You no longer want to kill yourself. Living is the best revenge, and George is going to help you get even. As you outline the plan, you fall into the motivational jargon that once inspired rooms packed with would-be property tycoons. You will drive George to your place, and he can spend the night there. The house is his until the banks reclaim it at ten tomorrow morning. He doesn't object. But then this is a man who has probably never made a decision in his life. When he gets out of the sleeping bag and you see the filthy clothes and the scars on his hands, 
You imagine him raging through the cottage, bottle in hand, violating everything. And for the first time today, you smile. The nearer you get to the cottage, the stronger the feeling of dread is. You try to remember that you've been given a way out, and this is the price. Early in the journey, George starts to tell you about his own life, a wife dying in childbirth and an estranged daughter. But after everything that you've been through, you are in no mood for hard luck stories. He must have sensed that, because now he sits silently beside you, huddled in the overcoat you gave him, stroking the sleeping dog on his knee. But as you get closer, you are overwhelmed by the need for another voice. You almost shout, urging him to smash and destroy everything in the house. But he doesn't respond. And now, as you turn down the lane, you have to fight to keep driving. You almost push him out of the car, gesturing towards the cottage. And as he turns to go, you hand him the shotgun and stuff a wad of banknotes into the pocket of the overcoat. He doesn't say anything, and you watch him trudge to the cottage, the dog running behind him, barking. When he's safely inside, you accelerate away. The relief and elation are intoxicating. Nothing would ever have induced you to go back into that cottage. And there you have the essential difference between you and the man you have chosen to take your place. He is afraid. But you are a coward. Inside the house, George turns on the lights. He looks round the sitting room with its oak beams and begins to breathe again. He wanted a way out, and miraculously, it has happened. The feeling of fear and revulsion he felt for the man is replaced by gratitude. Here, in this strange house, for the first time, he is not afraid. He takes in the room with its books and piano and the photographs, and tries to put it together with what the stranger told him. And he knows beyond all doubt he has been lied to. In the kitchen, he finds a washing machine and a tumble dryer, and he strips off his clothes and puts them in the machine. Naked, he looks round the kitchen, the dog following him. There is a steak in the fridge, and he fries it with onions and potatoes, while the food is cooking, he inspects the wine in the rack by the fridge, selecting a bottle of red. He cuts the steak in half, gives one half to the dog, puts the other on a plate, sitting at the table, eating slowly, occasionally sipping the wine. Afterwards, he goes upstairs and runs a bath. He rummages in the bathroom cabinet until he finds shaving cream and a woman's razor. He carefully shaves off the beard. The gaunt face staring back at him in the mirror is someone he has been hiding from for a long time. He clambers into the bath and sinks down, letting the warm water soak over him. From downstairs comes the comforting thump of the tumble dryer, and he closes his eyes and sleeps. The dog worries at the door across the landing, barking and scratching, knowing that something is wrong. But he's only a puppy, and soon loses interest, padding into the bathroom to sleep beside his master. George is dressed, sitting on the sofa. Since he woke up, something has changed. There are things that have to be faced, and he has a journey ahead of him. He would like to stay here longer. There is a sense of warmth here, and although he does not understand it, he feels loved but he knows that he must start the long trek north. He goes into the kitchen and carefully washes up the plate and frying pan and puts the cork back in the bottle of red wine. Before he leaves, he picks up the photo of Jane and Anthony with me. You remember it, the one you took before you were lost to us. Without knowing why, he touches each of our faces, my grandson, then my daughter, and last me and I feel the unconscious blessing. Then he leaves the way he came, through the broken door, the dog trotting dutifully after him. The cottage is empty now. Jane and Anthony have gone on ahead of me. 
and now I too must pass from the place I have loved all these years. They will find our bodies in the upstairs room, spread-eagled on the bed, and there will be other intruders, policemen, pathologists, newspaper men, all come to pick over our bodies. When you came through the door, I shouted at you to stop, and I prayed that killing me would be enough for you, that you would spare your wife and son. But I didn't understand the depth of your rage. I've been here ever since, and I've been the voice in your head that you couldn't shut out. I was with you as you drove away, believing you were safe. It was the coat that punctured the illusion. It hit you so hard you nearly went off the road. The first question the police would ask, how did the intruder get hold of your coat? It was a delusion, like so many of your schemes. Forensics would establish that he could not have fired the gun, and of course he would identify the man who drove him to the cottage. Madness! You want to turn back and set fire to the cottage, burning him and the evidence of what you've done, but nothing can make you go there again. There's a moment of appalling clarity as you see the three frightened faces in the upstairs room huddled together for protection, and you let out a howl of such utter desolation that if it were possible to pity you, it would be now. Much later, you pass the garage where you stopped earlier, where you saw the boy who reminded you of the son you destroyed. You turn off the road, back into the ghost town and the building with the end spray-painted on the walls. I am here, as you lie awake in the ruined sleeping bag. Amazingly, your capacity for self-invention is alive. Alibis and excuses dance through your mind. Why should you be punished? You have done terrible things, but you are not to blame. As your mind races, you do not hear the white van pull up outside the building, or the bodies clambering through the broken window, or feel the murder in their hearts. Not until torches light up the room and you see the faces around you. One of them films you on his mobile as a rope of petrol arches through the air, dicing the sleeping bag. The last thing you see is the boy in the hood who reminded you of Anthony, striking a match. The intruders have come. And everything stops here. Thank you.